Good morning. Barry, how goes? All right. Josh? Hello, good morning. So I guess Glenn will show up today, probably. Perhaps. Did he sound interested? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you read everything he wrote in Messenger this morning, if he had time, but he uh, he asked about the Sunday sessions and the focus. I guess you already answered him, at least parts of it. So I think he probably will show up. If he does, I have a, um, a summary that will be useful to discuss again. Okay. Even if not, I think it'd be good because I wrote a bunch of things down. Yeah. <clears throat> Incidentally, Barry, mm -hmm. uh, what did you make of yesterday's session? Oh, it was good. I thought it was. I thought there was some good conversation. Um, it wasn't wasn't boring, and and it didn't wander off into too many hobby horses of of little interest. So yeah. <clears throat> basically stayed on topics of mutual interest, I think, among the participants. Yeah, I really do uh, acknowledge and admire uh, Joel for showing up and uh, yeah. representing. Yeah. Glenn. Hello, hello, hello. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to be back. Yeah, I haven't had the occasion to join for a while, but I have actually listened to a few of the meetings. So uh, I heard you mention Joel. I, I, I listened to the session when he was there. That was a really interesting session. There are two or three, I believe, with Joel that I thought were um, good exchanges, good interactions. I get a including lot of them. Including yesterday. Yeah. I don't know if, if it's been posted yet or if Glenn's seen it. No, I haven't seen it yesterday. I saw one where you discussed analytic <clears throat> theology, systems thinking, mysticism, and uh, yeah, mysticism, yep. especially you spoke about also yep. some very interesting things. Yeah. Yeah. So, by the way, Barry, yesterday's session is up on YouTube, but just hasn't been announced yet in GCC. Okay. Usually these things upload. Um, I don't necessarily do it within a day. And then I wait for the transcript and I wait to create the doc, you know, yeah, um, that, yeah. in order to then make the announcement. And sometimes that's <laughs> weeks after the actual event. But the YouTube video is usually there much before the announcement. Yeah, I think it was a week ago, it ran for almost four hours. So I figured the conversion to the closed captions would have probably taken the better part of a day. I did not know that it went that long. I think I left after two yesterday. Uh, not yesterday. I think it was last week. Yesterday only went for two, little about two hours. Yes, that's right. Yesterday only went for about two hours and maybe 15 minutes or so. Yeah. Anyway, Glenn, <clears throat> thank you for yeah. showing up because I think your appearance here, I believe in the for the first time since it got reconstituted, yeah. for me is an opportunity to sort of <clears throat> uh, review the hopefully the acceptable guidelines that I'm trying to lay out for this group. So I'd be curious to get uh, your feedback. And uh, obviously, here's Barry again and jo uh, Josh, if you choose to do so. So if you'd like, I could try and go over those. Those are not meant to be, by the way, complete because uh, I think as I do these things and I'm sure everything can be improved. So would you like to start with that? Yeah, great. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> here's the main thing. The way I see it, the difference between this Sunday group and the Saturday group is that this Sunday group is an attempt to put in place a number of the proposals that have been floated in Saturdays. So in particular, the proposal that we try and focus a bit better. What that really means is that we will need, in my opinion, to modify the way we engage. So instead of just random people saying, okay, I have something to say, it would be nice to say, here's our focus right now. 
and let's really explore that focus. And then if we really want to talk about something else, we say something like, okay, can I change the subject now? Can I talk about this? And see if other people have other ideas related to the subject that you know are more pertinent to, pertinent to the current subject before we move along. That's a simple request. These are just requests, okay? And moderation can help with that, but hopefully I'm uh, looking forward to when all of us can see uh, the focus and can help manage all of that without a central individual moderator. Okay, that's idea number one. Idea number two, our brains, this thing between our crania skulls, <clears throat> are the pinnacle gifts, <clears throat> gifts from, you call it, either God, the universe, randomness, biologists, who cares? They are pinnacle gifts. And I believe it is time to learn how to use that particular gift. In particular, I want to acknowledge emotions. Emotions, in my opinion, are indicators that compel us to think. They're indicators that compel us that there is something that we need to focus on. But high emotions can derail thinking. So my request and my attempt to elucidate is my own personal belief that we need to move through, we need to process emotions in order to think optimally not to ignore them, not to suppress them, not to mock them, not to deride or diminish them, not to shame them or any of those other things. It's to use them as indicators so that we can then move from this gift to this gift and ideally all of them together, okay? That's idea number two. Idea number three is in any domain of discourse, we're subject to language, we're subject to the way we interact, and that axioms at the basis of these languages or models of thinking or whatever, they define our domain of discourse. And that's acceptable. We can move through any different frame of reference we like, okay? But in any frame of reference, at least you know, for now, we haven't known of any that can just represent absolute truth. There's always a gotcha, and the gotcha is always in the axioms or in the uh, mappings to you know, how, we be, how we interact and how we behave. So that's, that's another key idea. Just think of Archimedes and his lever. He can do anything he says, but he's gotta have a firm fulcrum. He's gotta have a firm point on which to utilize his lever, okay? To me, those axioms represent some of those uh, leverage points. Next one, agreements are helpful and are facilitative. They, they can help us move along, okay? They don't need to be punitive, as I've been saying all along in GCC. They are just intended to help. There's nothing to shun or you know, push away in this notion of agreements, okay? Next one. Group memory starts with individual memory. Individual memory can be just in your brain, or you can actually try and augment it, as some people do with, you know, let's say this notion of a second brain is actually becoming more prominent and people are starting to use that phraseology. But whether or not you just use this brain, this, this wet one, or you augment it with something else, whether it's electronic or whether it's paper or whether it's something else, okay? It starts with individual memory. And then if we choose to, then we can merge them and link them up as we interact, okay? But this idea is that memory is crucial, especially if we're trying to form quote unquote progress, okay? All right. Okay, the next idea, all agreements, all changes in the way we do things can be revised through an RFC process, okay? Put out a, 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 an idea. It's a good idea, according to you. Uh, receive the remarks. 
the comments and then uh, allow some time for that energy and interaction to subside. And then uh, we take it as uh, de facto and then we apply, okay? And we'll revise that as we go, okay? Okay, the next idea is we attempt to grow and explicate our group memory concurrently, not serially. In other words, in every area where we're trying to push the envelope, we do the best we can at the current moment. And when we know better, we do better. That's the Maya Angelou idea. Okay, don't get blocked by saying, I gotta do this prerequisite before I can move on to the next step. That's the waterfall model. Try and move concurrently because this may be of interest to a subset of us. This other thing might be of interest to a subset of us. We can each push the envelope and refer to each other as we need to, okay? So in each area, we start with our current best understanding. Don't get blocked by those uh, interactions. Do the best we can. So that to me is a quick current view of the heuristics and guidelines I like to propose for Sundays. You'll notice that many of them have been discussed and proposed for Saturdays, but the Saturday format doesn't really help that along. So I'm hoping that we can evolve a format on Sundays which by the way, currently it's a very personal name I use. We don't have to use it, but personally I call this the Collaborology Study Group, okay? But if you note, there is an accompanying group that Barry and I are trying to start up, which is really, really trying to apply scientific method, analytical theology, model-based reasoning, critical and systems thinking, mathematics, logic, you know, all of those things which this gift allows us to do when we are not triggered, okay? And we attempt to drill through a lot of ideas that are circulated in the media, in memes, on social, uh, social media, in, in mainstream media, whatever, okay? So even ideas like democracy is good, I like to drill into those things. Even ideas like, you know, ethics must come from religion. Oh, we would like to blast that out of the water, okay? Especially with the posting that Barry uh, shared this morning, okay? And to lean into all of these ideas around current um, light work, uh, downloading truths from the universe, all of that, I'm not dismissing them. I'm trying to lean into them, and I'm trying to find the foundations of them. And where there is no foundation, then I hold that we have, and it's our privilege, to just disregard. That's a controversial statement, okay? But the claim, in my opinion, the responsibility for the claim is on the person who makes that claim. And if there is no evidence, if there is no substantive, substantive, subst sorry, substantive foundation for claims, then anyone can make claims. This is the flying spaghetti monkey argument, right? So if I want to make a flying spaghetti argument and somebody else is making a XYZ argument, we're on equal footing. The difference is who can come up with better and good evidence. That's what I'd like to uh, share, okay? Good, all right. So does that make sense, Glenn? Yeah, yeah, sure does. Yeah. Does that make sense, Josh, Barry? Kayla, yep. we'll recap it for you, okay? Any uh, feedback, uh, Glenn, Josh, Barry? Um, yeah, well, do you guys want to go first? or I think uh, I have just, a lot of ideas. I'll just say very briefly that I was glad to hear Sam mention a focus of one of the elements being emotions, because as you may know, that's the focus of my personal academic research for the last 35 years is the role of emotions in learning and problem solving. And it's important, as I used to say, emotions are the instrument panel on the dashboard of life. They, they really tell you how you're doing or not doing and interpreting emotions and using them to guide the direction of your thinking and problem solving is a useful it, it, it's it's part of mindfulness
Great. Yeah, can I uh, respond with a few things? Please do, Glenn. And then after you do, then I think we'll do a recap for Kayla. Yeah, great. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it makes a lot of sense. So um, I wrote down point one, focus. Uh, yeah, we, we discussed that a lot before. I think that uh, I, th I think that's very desirable that um, when we a certain topic and um, we really try to drill in to it. And when something comes up, a question comes up, if it's possible to put that in there before losing it, for losing the thread. I mean, it's not always so easy, but I guess that's a kind of a, a skill to manage to make sometimes interject a, a short thing in a way that is conductive to flow. And uh, when you say, yeah, our brains are the pinnacle gifts, learning how to use it, emotions, emotions being a part of mindfulness, indeed. Uh, yeah, that, that, you know, I, I tend to view this very much from sort of the point of view of um, moment to moment presence or, or consciousness with the senses, brain, body, emotions uh, viewed as one complete system. And that um, when there is a certain, you could say, self-awareness in the, in, yeah, certain self-awareness, then that brings those systems into communication. And then those are the moments when emotions can really guide our thinking rather than become an obstacle and it's obviously there's different types of emotions. Some are, are more conducive to learning. I feel that the, the emotion of wonder is a, is a very unique uh, kind of an emotion, which is very conducive to, to learning and conducive to clear thinking. Um, I heard somebody say once that fear and wonder cannot coexist. And uh, they're almost like opposites. So when you're confronted with something unknown, it's, uh, there's, there's often a reaction that can happen of, of fear, but there's an alternative reaction of wonder, something to some extent we can control. And that, I guess that's where attitude comes in. And, and attitude obviously has to do with thinking the whole way of thinking, but it also, you know, has to do actually with the attitude of the body, the, the posture and uh, the movement pattern of the body, all of that's included in that word attitude. <coughs> and so so it's, it's, it's clearly connected with that. You mentioned language and axioms. Um, yeah, because that, that, that comes up for me, this idea of um, Dictipedia that you mentioned before, that, very helpful when one person says something that that person makes clear what they mean by the terms and and that's also important for the listener to to try to listen for what does this person mean with the terms this person is using now and, and maybe put aside all the other you know millions of other possible meanings that that word can have and, and often has because we've all experienced it. Every word tends to have a, a multitude of different meanings, depending on the person using it, the reasons they use it, the uh, you know, cultural background, the context, all, all of this stuff. But so that's why it can be really helpful if, if we sort of focus on when when say this, what do I hear mean by this? And and maybe ask some questions if possible clear that we can save a lot of time and, and a lot of unnecessary misunderstandings and, and, and kind of get to what are the axioms and uh, what, what is the you know, framework that this person is, is operating from and, and so on. 
Yeah, yeah, you mentioned agreements, they can be helpful and they can be revised. And you mentioned um, group memory and individual memory. Yeah, that I have some ideas regarding that. I, I could actually today, if you want to show you something called the obsidian, where I've kind of created a sort of a brain or the beginning of a brain where you have a, a graph view. I think it's a really great example of of what could be a very useful tool for thinking. And uh, I'm, I'm certain that something like Obsidian could be really helpful as a collaborative tool if, if each person has their own, you know, Obsidian and, and they can screen share and it all builds on this idea that memory begins with personal memory. Um, and uh, the great thing about that is, of course, that you can, it's basically all the standard software tools, but you have this beautiful graph view so you can see all your documents as, as a cloud with, with networks between them. And you can create um, networks between them. So it's a little similar to the brain, but, but Obsidian is actually free. So you get, it doesn't cost anything. And uh, there's a few plugins that cost a little bit, but I think it's pretty cheap. So, so that's obviously a very interesting, uh, could be an interesting alternative to at least look at uh, for, for, for both as a thinking tool and group memory tool, personal memory tool, uh, and so on. And when you mentioned this um, uh, RFC, they, there I, that's an idea I think about a long time based on many previous conversations come up with this concept that I call uh, interesting possible improvements or, or interesting possible alternatives. Because I, I sometimes feel that in social media, the paradigm of, of commentary feels to me a little flawed because commentary very often becomes judgment. And you sort of either like something or you don't like something. It would be really great if, if instead of commentary in that sense, if, if people could come with actual suggestions for alternatives uh, and we could call it like interesting possible alternatives. And uh, I think that's a very, very interesting model for this RFC uh, way of working. You know, uh, you can basically do it with any you know, platform, any medium. So, so it's not really about the medium or the platform, it's, it's just, a, a practice, you know, that if somebody, for example, has an idea, they, they write that idea, they formulate it, you know, succinctly, like, for example, Barry said that he likes to do it that way and formulate it, and then share that. And then instead of saying, oh, I agree with this, disagree with that, like this, you could actually come with some specific suggestions. <laughs> yeah, specific suggestions. Um, I, yeah, I'm gonna wrap it up, but move concurrently. Leading into current ideas, yeah, you know, we've been doing that anyway, so that that falls naturally. But uh, yeah, this is uh, this is uh, this is very interesting stuff, and I'm very interested in the topic, obviously, of reason, science, analytic theology, mysticism, systems thinking, psychology spiritual practices, ritual disciplines, philosophy, sort of the intersection of all those topics is, is something that I think is really, really interesting because that's when you can really look into some of the potential for thinking, uh, you know, e evolution of our thinking, let's put it that way. Yeah. Personal and collective. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, so welcome, Kayla, welcome, Stacy. Um, you guys were not here when we went through uh, my clarification of what these Sundays are about for me. So in order to, uh, and by the way, we did that and uh, Glenn was giving his uh, feedback on some of that. That's what you just heard the tale of. So if you like, uh, we can move uh, to try and recap that quickly again for both of you. And uh, that way you wouldn't have missed anything and uh, I get a chance to explain it again, and hopefully it makes even more sense to those who only have heard it once so far. And I think that would be Glenn. I think Barry might have heard some of these things more than once, but uh, not in such a succinct way. 
So with your indulgence, let me do this again, just very quickly, okay? So as I mentioned, uh, GCC on Saturdays in the barn raising has adopted uh, throughout history a format which has been much more all-inclusive and non-focused and almost non-moderated. And so what I'm attempting to do on Sundays is to try and put in practice a number of the things that have you know, been discussed and put on the table on Saturdays. So the first idea is that uh, we, we benefit when we attempt to focus and really drill into an area rather than just getting distracted and pulled away by random thoughts and random contributions or even contributions which would have been relevant five minutes ago, but now appear to have come from left field simply because of where the topic has gone. Okay, so the first idea is focus is better than random scatterings of reactions and comments and topics, you know, just as Glenn was talking about. So an attempt to moderate uh, will be minimal, uh, at least until we all grow the skill to sort of understand where we're focused and understand and mutually moderate where we say, hey, we're still not done with this topic. Let's do this first before we move on to the next one. Okay, and ideally then draw those connections or those model extensions that Glenn was just talking about. That's idea number one. Idea number two is that throughout all of history, all the 13.8 billion years, et cetera, or whatever the uh, duration has been, that at least to our knowledge, we as human beings have been uh, the gifts, you know, of a lot of evolution, a lot of evolutionary biology. We're capable of things that, you know, most other species that we see and we understand are not capable of. And the gift that I would like to highlight for us is even though there are many other species and other forms of life that have physical structure, uh, ways of moving uh, matter around, ways of ingesting energy, etc. To me, the thing that we are gifted with that most other species have not yet evolved to that extent is what's right here, okay? Almost everybody else has every other organ and they have rudimentary versions of the, the gray matter in our crania. But that our brains really are the pinnacle gifts of the universe, of God, of randomness, of evolution. So the idea is let's learn how to use this gift to augment the rest of what we're capable of. All other species know how to forage for food, exist as communities, do a number of different things. But this gift that we have, these trillions of connections and neurons that are capable of you know, just things we cannot even yet imagine. We haven't got a handbook for that. And we haven't got a user's manual for it. We've got to figure it out on our own as we experiment with it, okay? Now, an attendant idea of that is emotions will clearly arise as we discuss things, as we live life. But I view, my view is, emotions are indicators that there's something for us to, to think about, to focus on, to try and think through, to try and work through, to try and you know live through. And that when we're in an emotional state, our typical observation is that high emotions in particular, almost all emotions, but all, especially high emotions will derail our optimal thinking. That we don't you know, think clearly. We sometimes you know, cut off thinking in preference for action sometimes when we're in high emotions. We don't actually think about what could lead to optimal outcomes when we're derailed by or otherwise known as triggered by these. So I want to be very, very clear. This statement is not an attempt to ignore emotions. It's not to suppress them. It's not to mock them. It's not to diminish them, and it's certainly not to shame them. It's to acknowledge them, but to use them to try and get us to use this pinnacle gift so that we can actually then create the best possible outcome, the best possible future. Now, in that, if we're using this gift, okay, any system of thought, and many people have studied this, systems of thought rely on foundations. 
either you call them axioms or you call them assumption or you call them building blocks or you call them, you know, platform or whatever. But those systems of thinking will be constrained and almost defined by those initial axioms, those initial presuppositions. But that's okay because we can move through any number of frameworks we want and look at things in different ways and hopefully then evolve our understanding uh, concurrently as we do this, okay? The next one is, in addition to focus, agreements can facilitate and are helpful. I've spoken at length on this. Uh, they don't need to be punitive. I just want to refer to that again, okay? And the next one is this notion that if we're trying to work together, then group memory, a group understanding of what we've already covered, what we've already worked on, what the model is that we're working on. This is group memory is vital if we're trying to actually collaborate, okay? But group memory starts with individual memory. If I don't have any memory, how can I share it with you, okay? So that individual memory can be either just this, or as we learn, we can augment our wet memory with things like what uh, Glenn was talking about, with either paper or, you know, obsidian, you know, electronic forms of it, or even, you know, more sophisticated th things. And as we evolve our individual memories, then we can share them, we can link them together, we can merge them, we can actually create models out of them. That's the presumption, pre, uh, that's the supposition that memory is important for group memory, which is then important for how we actually do things together, how we collaborate. Any of this and the way we interact can be changed, augmented, improved via a uh, version of the RFC process. Put out a good idea, get some comments back, wait for that interaction to subside. Hopefully then that has led us to a good uh, improvement to our agreements. And that across all the things we're doing, let's do all of this discussion and agreements and improvements concurrently. Let's not wait to say, hey, we need to build this before we can build that, okay? Let's take the best version of this, the best version of that, put them together, and as each improves, we will then modify and improve accordingly, okay? This is the Maya Angelou idea that we do the best we can, and when we know better, we do better, okay? So those were the ideas that I felt I wanted to share as my thinking right now for how Sundays are different than Saturdays. I'll stop now for comments, over. Stacy, Kayla, any feedback, Josh? Um, this is just my own memory. I feel like I've been down this road with not just you, but the group so many times that I've already given my feedback so many times. So I'm just going to say, if we go back to any collective memory, which is where we decided to record, I've given my feedback on this so many times. I just, I think everyone here has heard it. So I don't want to bore anyone in the room. <laughs> that's my feedback. I hope that's helpful. I'm trying to be constructive and thank you for standing up Sunday and let's trying to do something amazing. So this is great. I'm loving it. Thank you. On the topic of memory, I adopted a practice about 30 years ago that if I spent any quality time thinking about a topic and formed my best thinking about it, I published it in online memoranda blogs typically. Or, but something that I can find. So when a topic comes up, when an issue comes up of some interest, more often than not, I can find a memorandum, an online memorandum of my best thinking on it, which typically can be read in about five minutes, but might, rep might represent many, many hours of thinking before it was written. Thanks, Mary. Stacy, Kayla? Yeah, so two things. One is, I just want to say that traditionally the female way has been to tell their things through story. I'm always resistant to having to first write things down because a lot of 
a lot of my memory is in the form of story that wants to be shared, but not necessarily in the same way. So I just wanna be a little sensitive to many people that are also used to that and not have those stories not make it into the whole. Um, and my comments are really about before we even get started. So in our shared memory, could you just put a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you believe that humans in general don't, haven't really been thinking they have like a default setting. Could you agree with that comment? Is there anybody that disagrees with that? Okay. So if that's the, sh you agree, Josh, right? You were shaking your head no. No, no, I'm, I'm shaking my head. You're saying, do humans have a shared memory? I'm sorry, can you repeat it again? Cause I, sure. I didn't quite get it. Sure. I wanna know if we're in agreement with the following statement. Many humans just have default thinking. They don't really think. They just. Most people are brain damaged language monkeys. Yes, I agree. Okay. So if that's our shared memory, my question to the group would be, what is the one smallest thing that we could do that would sort of catch us before we fall into the same thing that we recognize that we all do? And it's sort of a rhetoric. I do have an answer for it, but that's, you know, that, that would be an answer that I would throw in. But that's, I think coming to a shared question is a good beginning place. And I'd like to go there before we go on to all the rest of the stuff. I'm not sure I understand. If you had not included that very last statement, I think I was with you. I didn't understand that last statement, however. So the last statement is me saying, can I give my answer first? <laughs> <laughs> Please make it appropriate, sure. <laughs> so, so my answer is, if we got used to asking questions, like think about the game of Jeopardy, you have to answer in the form of a question. If we got used to doing that, it would probably do a number of things, but even if it only did one thing, that would be a start. So for example, if it was practice to always putting things in the form of the question, that might change some of the emotional impact that people would feel when being questioned because that's the process. There's nothing to be triggered about. It would also be a way for us to second guess our own thing. Not set, yeah, not second guess. It would be a way for us to question our own thinking because it would provide that extra amount of time. And it might offer the possibility of getting different perspectives just simply because of the different questions that we come in with. So that's what I meant. Okay. I think I understand that then. Uh, before we move to you, Jack, can we also check and make sure that Kayla has got a chance to respond? Yep, I'm here. Hey, Kayla. Um, <laughs> so everybody here knows I'm a total Sam Hahn fan. <laughs> and I will, <laughs> I love listening to you, Sam, but I'm going to go out of a limb here and take a chance. Um, I think focus is fantastic. Uh, it's, a, it's a great topic. However, I do feel like most of the responsibility in my experience would fall on the moderator. Um, and it's only because um, we as human beings have a tendency to fail at listening and begin to ramble. And I think that a moderator, um, in this case, when it comes to focus, can wrangle us in, in a very simplistic view. Um, I love you all. <laughs> I think you all have great ideas, but Everybody, including myself, has a tendency to kind of go off. Um, what Stacy is saying, I completely agree. When you're talking about storytelling, people tend to listen because it does come from your own perspective, as opposed to some type of hypotheses that um, can be challenged. And it's a, it, it's a good point of focus, if I'm understanding that. So 
I'm here to listen. I'm actually um, braising short ribs right now. So I've got, you know, my, my oven hissing, but um, yeah, just go off you guys. <laughs> and um, yeah, I would just ask that the moderator play a bigger role, you know, in, um, in focusing and I'm complete. Thanks, Kayla. Yeah, Josh. I'm just trying to synthesize what uh, Stacy just said, and thank you, Kayla, for what you said, because that was very poignant and clear. And um, trusting the process is what I'm getting from this whole conversation, is if we created a process, so if someone said something, let's say Barry says, but why do we have it this way in the system or in society, or why do you think that, Glenn? And I came back with, here's what I think it is, but I'm going to supersede. I don't know everything. I'm just one person. So here's what I think. But what I've been questioning is this. And then someone can say, oh, I've questioned that. And I think it's this way. Or I've questioned that. And that's a line of questioning that's not worth going down. But here's what I question. So what I'm getting at is, would this be a process that we use for group Socratic method? But keeping disciplined and focused enough to say, I understood what the other person was asking. I have already either thought about it or I have something bubbling up for me in that moment. But don't leave the, the speaking engagement at that moment without posing another question to the group, which can either everyone say, you know what, not interested. <laughs> Sorry. Like, I wonder why I have dingleberries in the morning on my bum bum. No one cares. <laughs> but I wonder why the economy at this moment, why they're meeting in China for a World Economic Forum last Wednesday. Well, maybe that's interesting. Like, what is the Chinese economic advisor saying? And someone says, you know what? I actually read an article in Forbes magazine about that, and this is my take. So being very clear of our process of a two-parter, here is my opinion, my thoughts on the subject and then leaving it posing it back to the group so at least it continues and we stay either on focus or we shift focus but being clear that the next question is either totally off the mark like dingleberries in my bum or completely clear if we're talking about world economics or world politics so i hope that helps in other words if we can create a process where we do this but we don't do that that would create a clear process, a clear culture. And if someone does something that we don't do, at least we can call them out and say, we don't do that. But for this moment, we'll make an exception because it's juicy and we will, but we don't. So if someone new comes into the group and does a process where they start talking about their feelings and emotions and how the um, spirit has moved them to change our whole, like go off on a ramble, we go, you know, we don't do that. But you can use the process to do that in a clever way if you learn the process. Does that make sense? In other words, just a quick rule, like Stacy said, is answer in the form of a question or something that's so clear that someone cannot come into the group and not know how we stay on focus. I'm going to stop the rambling now. <laughs> okay, thanks. So if I were to internalize that myself, to me, it would be that if I'm thinking about something and I have a point that I'd like to make, perhaps I would then ask it in this following way. Stacy, have you considered blah, 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 blah? Would that be a way then that corresponds with the way you just described asking a question at the same time providing what it is that's in here that I want to convey? Yeah. Josh, answer first. Go ahead, yeah, Josh. just real quick. Um, the one thing we've done in many conversations here at GCC and other places is, did you clearly understand what Stacy said? So before you say, have you considered, you're assuming and making the assumption, first clarify what I heard you say Stacy was, and then have you considered, if that helps. If I can... Go ahead, Stacy. I was going to say, just make that in a form of a question. Do you mean that? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Barry. So from the perspective of question answer pairs, I tend to define information, technical information as a question answer pair. And so if somebody asks a really good question, 
and you really think hard about reasoning through an answer and you come up with an answer that you think is solid, publishing that question answer pair as a unit of information in a publicly retrievable, easily retrievable location. For me, that's blog. Whenever I think about a question and, and think through an answer, I write it up typically in a half page blog because I can find it. It's not in some spoken recorded uh, message in a video that's somewhere in a collection of hundreds of videos that who the hell can find it. It's gotta be someplace that I can find it in five minutes. So I would urge that, that practice, that if you've thought through a question and you think your thinking is solid, write up a unit of information as a question answer pair and publish it in an easily discoverable retrievable location where your best thinking is recorded in a memorandum. Okay, Barry, I'm writing that down in the notes. I think that's good. And by the way, I also added one more item in the notes, which is my workflowy outline for the guidelines that I just went through, uh, I think twice uh, today. So Colin, I don't think you got either of the first two times, but hopefully that uh, workflowy outline may make sense. And uh, if you don't make sense out of it, uh, let me know what needs to be clarified or you can actually uh, watch this and listen to this uh, when it gets posted, all right? So I also think that the ways that you're providing uh, suggestions for asking questions and uh, getting clarification before posing something else, I do believe that those are uh, very relevant and I'm not gonna try and elaborate on those because there's a number of other sources that do that way better than I do. Uh, MVC comes up to mind a lot, okay? So if you want to um, refer to those, I think. So I'm adding Barry's statement here. If you think you're thinking is solid, publish it in an easily retrievable location. Yeah, and that's the augmentation of individual memory, which I think can then be linked to so that we can create more uh, group artifacts, group models. And I like that. I will say one thing on that though, but Glenn has his uh, hand up. Glenn is yours on this particular point because my point is on this last thing that uh, Barry just said. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I had a response to uh, the question about questions. Um, what is the first smallest thing we can do to catch our tendency of default thinking. That, that seems like it was the question Stacy posed. Then she made the suggestion that we try to formulate our statements as a question or ending in a question and have a, a shared question. And uh, so she's nodding now. I take that as a yes. And, and then Joshua added this way of doing it. Have I understood you correctly? That this and this, sometimes referred to as active listening. And uh, so that's a very specific way to avoid misunderstandings. And it's an interesting challenge to see if I can reformulate what I just heard maybe in an even more succinct way, possibly, or a shorter way, but sort of the essence point of it. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really liking, I'm really, really liking that. Um, okay, one, I'll just finish with a question. Could also the formulation of a question be useful as the title of a document in the shared memory? Yeah, I'm gonna active yes on that one, as Stacy was, as I saw. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, many uh, articles are already written that way. Can I also just say maybe even two or three questions? 
Yeah, why not? Okay, so my response is a response to what Barry was saying about writing and blogging. Can I move on to that one? Okay, so this is where uh, I think that there's an interesting phenomenon where there's knowledge. Let's say this knowledge represents the blog that Barry wrote, right? So he's thought about a thing for hours and hours, come up with a very succinct way that kind of captures that key element, okay, which is kind of an abstraction from whatever process led him to that insight to begin with, probably, okay? Because there's many insights that could lead to this nugget of insight, but he's chosen to written, write it up this way, ideally, I would think, so that it's more applicable and not just specific to people who've taken the same path that he's taken, okay? So what I find interesting is, if there is this knowledge, and this is relevant now to this particular topic that we're talking about in conversation, okay? then you could say, okay, here's the article, read it, understand it, it has relevance, okay? So that is, I think, a very commonly practiced way of saying, I've, I've written this up, go read it, you'll understand me, okay? I think for me, it's more useful for me to understand when somebody like Barry says, okay, I wrote it up here, we are talking about XYZ here, and here's how that blog pertains, here's how it's relevant, here's how I map the insight in that blog to the conversation we have at hand. Here's the point, here's the mapping, here's the conclusion, here's the implications. All of that to me is interesting because I believe, and I'll say this again, and you guys are going to recognize this, Barry would do this differently for me than he would for my 19-year-old daughter or he would for any five-year-old. He would do it differently. So there is a chunk of knowledge, but then there is an act of touring someone through that knowledge so that that someone can get the maximum value out of it. That's a, this is a notion I call mentor, M-E-N-T-O-U-R, okay? Men, uh, Barry would be mentoring me by touring me through his writing, written works it, as it pertains to the topic at hand. And I think that is a very interesting skill. That's what teachers do, okay? That's what good teachers do. Okay, they don't necessarily draw all the implications, but they give you enough and they inspire you to be interested so that you can then draw the rest of those conclusions yourself. And not only that, it could say, oh, well, does Barry have other things like this that I could go do and then start doing that active research and proactively explore themselves. That, to my mind, is what a good teacher would do. So this knowledge versus mentor idea to me is always a very interesting and useful one because I can be pointed at the publications of the you know Academy for uh, uh, American Academy for uh, Advancement of Science AAAS and I can read all of their papers but it's going to require a lot of activity a lot of work on my part okay but if somebody says in that corpus of material there are these three papers that pertain exactly to this point that we are talking about right now. And they give me that tour through those three materials. This one makes this point. This one makes this other point. This one has a little refinement on these two. And here's why it's interesting to us at this moment. That to me is really, really, really high quality engagement, high quality collaboration. And that's what I'm trying to distill out of this idea called mentor. Over. Well, if I, I just want to speak from personal experience because I think that Barry's a wonderful teacher and our first interaction, the, the way he engaged me, and I just, I'm mentioning this because of the element of choice in terms of the learner has to choose to want to do this. He offered me a very difficult paper. It was hard for me to read. It might be easier for me to read now because I've been more immersed in the information. But at the time, it was really hard for me to read. But he invited me to jump on any point I wanted and add my own work to it. And that was something that was a motivating factor. And I took the time and I really, and it was, I mean, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, I just want to uh, reinforce what Sam said because Quality thinking, as Stacy had pointed out, is pretty rare. A lot of people don't do quality thinking 
often you don't really learn quality thinking if until you get to graduate school. And the two kinds of quality intelligence uh, that Howard Gardner added to his catalog of multiple intelligences. The last two he added and took him decades to add them, the ninth and 10th kinds of intelligence is systems thinking, that is deep quality, rational thinking and pedagogical intelligence, being able to explain and reveal it in an educational setting. So what Sam is talking about is rare and, and we know it's rare because Howard Gardner didn't even add them to his catalog of multiple intelligences until the very end. And they're the ninth and the 10th. And if you're lucky, a few percent of the public have even one of them, let alone both. This may be also that a test for our understanding if we can explain it well. Exactly. There are a lot of researchers who are very good in their research, but they're terrible professors. They can't explain it to their class. And so the, the ability to understand something and write it up and the ability to present it to an audience are two different skills. The pedagogical skill and the research skill are, are separable skills. And yeah, it's interesting that uh, in a non-academic context, a VC once really made this point very clearly. Uh, a partner and I were trying to pitch a company idea to U.S. venture partners. And the senior investor there, Erwin Fetterman, uh, he had previously funded my partner in a different uh, company. So we were actually trying to make a request for seed funding from U.S. VC. And when we got done, his gentle but very clear message was your sloppy expression might indicate sloppy thinking. If you clarify the way you express your idea, you might actually understand it better. Now he eventually did fund us, but that was very good guidance. Because if we actually cannot express our, our ideas clearly, we probably don't understand them clearly. Because if we did, we would probably express it clearly in the first place. So might I shift gears a little bit? Yeah. One of the things I wrote down in the uh, chat this morning was one of the activities that I imagine being fun for this particular group is to take what the mainstream media is throwing at us or take what social media is throwing at us, or even take what certain institutions are throwing at us, be it Wall Street or religions, you know, churches, et cetera, and really, really examine them. We did that a little bit last week with Joel, okay? And it was fun, okay? And um, I asked a number of questions. Joel was very engaging. I admire the way he engages. And so I actually, during the week, post a number of things and I collect a number of things for possible consideration on Sundays. And sometimes I actually interact with Barry in the middle of the week, simply because I can't wait. <laughs> so yeah, there's a number of things that fall into this category and there are just so many that I think even just that focus alone could keep this going for hundreds and thousands of sessions, okay? So anyway, I was about to pose one of them if we'd like to sort of shift into that mode since we've been going about an hour already into this particular set of guidelines that, that uh, I appreciate you all listening to and giving feedback on. Sorry, Howard, not Martin. I remembered incorrectly, Barry. Martin Gardner is fabulous too, but yeah. he passed away and he was the mathematical recreational yeah. games uh, guy. Okay. So how about we start with something that Barry just posted this morning? I haven't even read it yet, but it's fascinating. The title is fascinating. Okay. So the title is the brains of believers and non-believers work differently. Isn't that a juicy topic? Okay. Now, by the way, I recognize this in a video that I also linked to and referenced and shared months ago from Robert Sapolsky. 
It was the biological foundations or underpinnings of religiosity. And I don't know if many of you remember that. I would actually be fascinated if any of you actually watched it. It's a lecture at Stanford in behavioral biology. And uh, Robert Sapolsky is fascinating. He's got tons of insights. He draws on lots of different references. And he can talk and keep you fascinated, at least me, okay? Keep me fascinated. And, uh, it's, you know, teachers that can do that for an hour, or hour and a half, you know, at a time, in my view, are rare. And yeah. he's doing it without notes. He's doing it strictly by just telling his story. He has the ninth and 10th intelligence in spades, and he is a national treasure. Yes. Yeah. So, Barry, would you like to start us off in this statement? The brains of believers and non-believers work differently. Can you put it in the chat? I can't find it. I've been looking for the post. Uh, let's uh, see. Let me put it in the chat. Yeah. Put it in the chat. Here it goes. It is this link right here. Do you see it? Yes, thank you. Yeah, this was a piece of research uh, doing MRI brain imaging. You know, when people are thinking and solving a problem, if you put them in an MRI machine, you can see what parts of the brains are heating up and being used. And uh, in this research, they found that the part of the brain that lights up uh, seems to be an indicator of whether they're do what kind of thinking they're doing. And so a believer is somebody who adopts a thesis without, on faith without proof and acts as if it's the ground truth without actually knowing it just assuming it. And, and a non-believer is more like a scientist who says, I don't accept uh, an axiom or an assumption on faith. I need evidence to confirm it, or more importantly, I look for evidence to falsify it. Because really in science, the hard work is ruling out the axiomatic, potentially axiomatic beliefs or hypotheses that in the fullness of time will be revealed to fail. And so when they did these studies, they found that the people who are more like the scientists who are not accepting axiomatic beliefs or theses without some evidence that they cannot be falsified, different parts of the brain are lighting up compared to people who simply adopt things on faith because some authority promulgated it and they, and they adopted it without any attempt to confirm or refute it. So... I think that's important. That is that different kinds of thinking you can actually recognize uh, by neuroscience, which kind of thinking people are doing. Now, obviously I prefer the scientific approach and I deprecate the approach where you simply adopt assumptions on faith and then run with them only to run into difficulty or dead end or tragedy. And we see this in literature. You know, if you look at classical literature, there's comedies and tragedies and romantic comedies, all kinds of literature, and tragedy, if you, if you analyze what is a tragedy in literature, it's a story in which one of the characters, or maybe both, adopted a belief that was a misconception and then ran with it. And so they ended up in a, some kind of a collision and ended up in a tragedy. So adopting a misconception, naively adopting misconception and enacting it, that is living with the behavior that would that you that would be derivative if you if the belief were true gets you into trouble, and so, so that I think that's a very worthwhile thing to appreciate and and why it's so important not to get stuck in adopting an erroneous misconception and playing it out because you're going to be the guy who who has the tragedy. Stacy. It'd be really interesting to know if they took a look at the brains of scientists who believed in God, because, I mean, I think you need both ways of thinking together. Well, of course, God is, the word God is a pronoun, and pronouns, as you know, have antecedents, and it's important to get the correct antecedent for a pronoun, and what I find is that scientists who believe in something called the divine have a different antecedent for the word than say the fundamentalists who go to church on Sunday and simply accept you know, that God is this omniscient imaginary being. So 
the deep thinkers don't disbelieve in God, but they have a very different concept of what the word refers to. It refers to, a, for example, in the Kabbalah, there is a collection of, I think it's uh, 10 abstract qualities that an imaginary divine being would have. And these abstract qualities are qualities that a, an ordinary mortal can have or not have. So things like, for example, compassion, mercy and compassion. There's a whole list. So in Kabbalah, it's like a list of 10. Other systems might have a slightly different list of divine qualities. So having those means that you're emulating this imaginary divine creature. But it doesn't mean you are God. It just means that you have these divine qualities or you lack them. And, and that you can have that abstract concept without believing in a deity that is a representative being, storybook character who exemplifies all of them flawlessly. Nobody exemplifies divine qualities in, in total flawlessly. We're all flawed human beings. But you can imagine, at least for the purposes of telling stories of, of an imaginary storybook character who has them all flawlessly. Now, most people say, well, there's no such person on earth, surely. But you can certainly write stories imagining such a creature. Sam, you have your hand up. You know, um, if I'm to take a meta, uh, uh, an opportunity to make a meta comment, the fact that this article cites this phenomenon should compel me and will compel me actually this week to look at the foundations for this research, okay? So I think that's a way of saying, this is what we want to do in this particular group, okay? Not just accept it at face value, but just look at what led to this article. What are the foundations? The second thing I'd like to say before I relinquish the floor to Glenn is Barry cites, and I haven't really shared this before in any forum, but the scientific method, because it is all about falsification of the hypothesis, poses questions that say, you know, could this disprove this claim? When one actually asks that question, I have just realized that in too many discussion forums and conversations, asking that question of the idea often is taken as an attack by the person who expressed that idea. That is often triggering to that person. Because if I am asking a question to really understand the idea and to really get to truth, either with a big T or a little T, okay, that's my curiosity. It's not an attack about the person, but too often that person takes it as an attack. This is the phenomena I like to refer to as say, have you prepared for collaboration? Are you presenting yourself? in a collaborative form, form or you know, posture or perspective. Because if you take questions personally, then that's always gonna derail you. The conversation gets derailed. You're no longer looking for the truth. You're looking to you know, get somebody calmed down. You know, that's what gets in the way of really exploring ideas. So that is a phenomena I do see when people do not understand that certain questions are attempts to clarify truth rather than personal attacks. Over. Great. Yeah, ju just a few things. To that last point, it seems that one thing that can help a great deal to remove that is establishing a communication context, which is, is what we're doing here, for example. I think that, that that will at least reduce that problem. If you, for example, you have a comment on, on a thread to a perfect stranger, you don't know them, or often the situations when a when a question will be negatively taken, but it's very different if you know them a little bit and you sort of know where they're coming from. Uh, so that, so if the establishment of a communication context, especially if it's a learning context, which I think is what we're doing here, 
I think it it opens up a much greater space for for be, for questioning and thinking. Obviously, that was the one thing that came to me um, uh, about this belief. The first question that came to me when I heard the title of uh, what was shared was, so what is the definition here of religiosity? Then Barry made the distinction between believing in a deity as, as a sort of a, an image or a kind of a, a figure compared to a more abstract way of believing in something, a kind of an unknown divine power, for example. And here I can actually say that this is just my personal understanding of the word religiosity or religious mind, so to say. In, in For me, the religious mind is is first of all characterized by this ability uh, to believe in something that you don't know what is, which is the relationship to a mystery. So it's a it, it's a it's a mind which is capable of mystery, and uh, and that that is also seems very closely related to. An ability to think critically and reasonably and scientifically, to have the ability to hold a, a hypothesis as as an idea, but but you but you don't exactly know what the idea whether it's true. That's one thing. But may, maybe you don't even know exactly what the idea is. So, for example, a, a divine power or or even a super intelligence. It seems to me that per definition, I don't know what that is. If, if I knew what a super intelligence was, how could it be a super intelligence? I, I would have to presume that I have this super intelligence. So then I'm just sort of speaking about myself. So it seems that that is sort of a very, very deep uh, issue when it comes to these kind of topics. Uh, we could call them transcendental topics or, or metaphysical topics that that it's a question where there's a mystery at the very heart of the question and um, and uh, so that, that's why I was wondering when this word religiosity was used does this refer to I think the people who who actually have that mystery at the core of their belief or is it what I would consider the opposite, which is that they believe in some image representation and sort of take that to be the fact. And yeah, yeah, that, that was sort of what came up for me with that. Yeah, finished. Small comment, Glenn. When you speak and you're moving, I believe that your microphone is on some surface that is being uh, impacted. So there's a low uh, rumble that comes across, at least for me. Yeah, you're jostling your microphone when you move your body. Yeah. Okay. Put it a little closer and try to be more calm. Yeah. <laughs> I like it when you're animated, you know. I'm just yeah, it gets that animated. Has, it has uh, an effect on the microphone and is, the, the sounds that come across. Is the microphone on that white strip on the cable dangling from your headphones? Oh, I think it's, it's this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is it? Uh, do you hear yeah. me clear yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. No, that's yeah. the that's the live mic. Okay. Yeah. That that's it. Yeah, there must be a volume control then. Right. But, but did you did you hear what I said or did yes. it make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But may I then go back to the original question of the article? The question I would like to ask is: Before this article, have any of the rest of us? seen any statement or any published work, any um, indication that this phenomena has been studied before, that brain activity in people who believe versus people who are non-believers 
can be characterized and measured and can be seen as different. Has anybody come across that before? Not this particular distinction. Other distinctions, yes, but not this particular one. Anybody else? Stacy? I, I haven't, but I do want to say something. I have observed where people that don't believe in God are just as bad things. Like I would suspect that if you looked at their brain, it would look the same as believers. Even though they don't believe in God, they still have that kind of just accepting of whatever they're told thought process that's not necessarily linked to God. That's what I want to say. I can see that. I wanted to pose another question. It's getting a little bit off topic. So I want to circle back to this article after I pose this question, maybe five or 10 minutes from now though. Okay, but I want to pose the question. Greta Thunberg. Many people have said, and I believe uh, it's been reported that she's autistic. And so she doesn't seem as phased by personal attacks, you know, on her youth or on her lack of credentials or whatever. Uh, she's just stating things as she sees them. And she's you know, always on point. I admire the way she does it. And I then think about other stories of people who are autistic, who are unable to not, okay, so characterized by society, they're unable to be as empathic or as compassionate or whatever, you know, feel their emotions as deeply. And, but I'm wondering, is it possible to see that at least some form of autism is a leveling up in our stage of evolution? That we could actually be focused so much on just our thinking and not be derailed by emotions as much. It's a different way of looking at autism and saying maybe there's a evolutionary value there. Over. I actually live with a person who is diagnosed with uh, Asperger. So I would definitely agree that, that it can be a, an update. She, she definitely has what I consider unique skills, but I do not in any way view her as being emotionally limited. Actually, I would say the exact opposite. She experiences emotions very powerfully and has enormous amount of empathy. Um, so I, I think that the, the autism spectrum is a very big spectrum. There's, there's different versions of it. There's maybe some which are very intellectual, but there's definitely some people who are, what you call hypersensitive. And uh, Lindis uh, is, is definitely closer to that category. My girlfriend that I live with. Do you know who Simon Baron Cohen is? Does that name ring a bell with anybody? Sasha Baron Cohen? No, his cousin Simon Baron oh, Cohen. Cousin cousins, Simon. Their second oh, okay. cousins. Simon Baron Cohen is a neuroscientist, a British neuroscientist, who studied autism and in particular Asperger's syndrome. And he proposed a relabeling of Asperger's sy syndrome for a number of reasons. First of all, it's just the name of the guy, one of the two guys who, who first documented it. But Simon Baron Cohen proposed to call people with this syndrome systemizers. That's Simon Baron Cohen's proposed term because people who have Asperger's syndrome turn out to be pretty competent at systems thinking and they think systematically. So he says systemizers. Now I happen to have a PhD in systems thinking and I know that I'm on the spectrum. I, uh, Simon Baron Cohen developed something called the eyes test where you see just the eyes of, of a model. And you're supposed to figure out what emotional state they're in just from seeing their eyes. And it's an instrument that will sort of determine where you are on the neurotypical versus the systemizer or Asperger's axis. And when I took the test, I felt exactly in the, at the boundary point, exactly in the middle between the average for the neurotypicals and the average for Asperger's. So <laughs> I'm not neurotypical and I'm not Asperger's, I'm half Asperger's. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, can, I have one foot sort of in either domain. Um, and <clears throat> when I talk to a psychologist, he says, he says, Barry, you do have affect. Because a lot of people think that I, I'm emotionless. And, and I, 
I was talking to a. Um, I've seen you blow up, Barry. Oh yeah, I can get emotional. <laughs> I, I don't. I, you know, it's not not common. <laughs> but yes, I can have anger and I can have lots of emotions. But a person who's very good at being facial she was a psychologist at Bell Labs. She says, she says, I can read most people. She says, Barry, I can't read you at all. I have no idea what your emotional state is when I uh, examine your countenance. And I thought that was very interesting, but I didn't know the name of my emotional state to disclose it until maybe a decade later. And then I realized my default emotional state is to be vexed and perplexed. And when she couldn't read me, guess what state she was in? <laughs> she was perplexed. So she was in a state of perfect empathy with me when she said she couldn't read my state. And, and I once asked um, an expert whether he considered perplexity to be an emotion. And he said, no, nah. he says, I don't. I think it's a cognitive state. But I think that to be vexed and perplexed is an emotional state that arises in the course of learning and research and solving problems. Isn't it called confusion? Confusion is more recognizable. I mean, you, you can sort of see people kind of, you know, react when you say something that, that that's bewildering and confusing, that's e more easily readable. But if you're pondering a, a problem, an abstract problem that's not life and death, just to say a problem that you're working on, say in your professional life or your hobby life, you're not gonna be, you know, doing all this kind of this stuff. Although people will observe that I will do this. If I'm giving a talk, I will sometimes do that. And I didn't even know I was doing that until I saw a video of myself in a Toastmasters meeting. Um, so there are, there, there are signifiers uh, of the affective state of somebody who's on the spectrum systemizer, but they're not common because they're not very many people. And unless you live in a culture where you're surrounded by problem solvers, like a place like MIT or graduate school at Stanford or Bell Labs, you won't necessarily have enough observation uh, to recognize the micro expressions. So yeah, um, different. The emotion that you have depends on where you are in your lifelong learning journey. So children who are very early in their lifelong journey are very demonstrative in their emotions. And it, as you get up to people who are sages, who have lived you know for decades and have thought about lots of things and you know adapted well it's harder and harder to read them. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have emotions, just means that it's hard to read. You, know, you have to ask them to disclose them. Sam. You know, um, just in the interest of disclosure, I have been accused by people close to me of being on the spectrum. So I don't react. I don't you know, take it positively. I'll take it negatively. I just, right. I'm curious about that. Yeah, and, and also, one of the things about a scientist, are you still talking, Sam? Yes. Oh, sorry. I thought you were done. <laughs> let, me, let me make uh, one more observation. That is that um, many of you have heard me tell, tell the story about the uh, Chinese village farmer whose horse ran away, right? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. And the idea <laughs> behind that is, you know, that there seems to be this phenomenon, among others, to quickly label things as good or bad. Your horse ran away. Oh, that's bad. Oh, your son broke his leg. Oh, that's bad. Oh, the horse came back with two horses. Oh, that's good. Oh, your son didn't get drafted. Oh, that's good. It seems that people really want to put labels on things in their limited understanding of life. You know, they take one incident that you know spans a few minutes or a day, and are so willing to put a label on it. Yeah. So as I understand that story. I less and less go to those extremes of labeling or even expression, you know? I mean, yes, uh, I'm doing reasonably well by most accounts. It could all change with a single phone call. Yep. A few years ago, I was doing really badly, you know, financially at least. And yes, everything could change in the span of a phone call. So I find it curious that people really want to express goodness and badness and happiness and sadness and all of these different extremes so much you know it just seems like a very hmm, reactionary way to go through life that's a, just a quick observation to this uh, last piece of conversation over
I think that ties into what I want to add about um, the vexed and perplexed, whatever you would call that. And I think that frustration ties in there and different people will experience a different, a different level of frustration at vexed and perplexed. And I think part of the reason they want to label things so quickly is they want that feeling of certainty. Okay, so one last thing, if I may. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, I forget exactly when, uh, I could do the arithmetic, but I think it was in the late 90s. Okay, so 20 plus years ago. Um, I started taking these courses from an organization called, uh, what was it called? Uh, productive Learning and Leisure. I think it's at ProductiveLearning.com. Anyway, they're one of my earliest encounters with the success industry. You know, people who say, hey, take responsibility, hey, build your network learn how to control your emotions, da, 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 all the you know, things that you know, people learn through various different forms. But they've made a company out of it and they help people go through this. And they struck what, in my opinion, is an ingenious way to do this, which is they have learning vacations. So they'll go off to you know, Costa Rica and go diving. And then you know, when they're not diving, they'll talk about emotional maturity or you know, communication skills or you know, emotional triggers, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So anyway, that organization has been um, a place where I examined a lot of these ideas. And what came up for me, just simply because of the two words that uh, Barry and Stacy just used were, in my mind, life was always peachy keen until I hit this pattern of confusion, which quickly led to frustration, which quickly led to some bad thing, okay? So confusion to frustration to this bad thing to just, you know, jolt me and say hey wake up you dipshit you know you learn something okay it's that you know pattern that seems to always recur so it was curious for me to hear this from you um that hey there's this confusion bit this vexed and perplexed bit which to me maps to confusion which then leads to frustration which then leads to either acting out or something bad happening and then that leading to geez god damn it i gotta grow and you know evolve again you know that sort of thing so that was just a pattern I saw in myself. Ooh. When I was hosting the puzzle activity at the Science Museum, one summer there was a family from Portugal who came in and sat down and the two children were doing the puzzles. The mother was a teacher uh, who would teach English to Portuguese. So she was, had both languages. And it, before I realized it or knew that they were from Portugal, I said to the older boy who was struggling with the puzzle, I said, are you vexed and perplexed? And the mother said, oh, he doesn't know English. She says, but what was that word you said? And I said, vexed, perplexed. She says, I don't recognize that word. So I brought up the Google Translate and I translated vexed into Portuguese. She says, oh, I know that word. So then I took the Portuguese word and translated it back to English, came back as angry. Mm. Mm. So another meta comment. My question was originally around this article from Psychology Today about biological differences in brains observed between thinkers and non -think well, sorry, believers and non-believers, non okay? Not thinkers and non-thinkers, believers and non-believers. I followed that up with a question about, has anyone seen other evidence for this? If not, this is really, really pioneering work. On the other hand, I gotta believe other people have hypothesized this already. That would be my surmisal. So that's why I want to go look into this a bit more. They clearly think differently. The question is, is the different thinking recognizable in what part of the brain is doing the information processing? And I participate in a group um, at Grace Chapel in Lexington, Mass, which is a bunch of scientists who are in the congregation, and they have a monthly meeting on science and theology, discussing topics in science and theology. And I was kind of surprised at some of the participants who are true believers and, and say, then I don't have to do any thinking about it. It's already been thought. And I go, really? Here we are, a science and theology group, and this person is saying, because of my belief, I can lay back and not do any thinking. So yeah, it's very clear that, that there's evidence, maybe anecdotal evidence, of different levels of thinking or non-thinking as a, as a determinant of 
whether you believe something and accept it without question versus whether you do question it. In, in my religious upbringing in Judaism, we were taught to question everything. That was the whole point, was to ask good questions and think through the answers and not take anything because some authority figure promulgated it. So that was a very different perspective on my appreciation of religion versus other cultures. But it's anecdotal, so um, yes, evidence, but that's... Glenn. Glenn. Yeah, uh, it's just something that came to mind uh, when uh, you mentioned this tendency to label something good or bad immediately. Maybe what Stacey talks about with default thinking as compared to genuine thinking. I think this is, uh, we're still kind of on that topic. And uh, I remember the reading a few days ago, well, actually, it was a video with uh, Darren Stevenson, who is one of the most, uh, one of, I consider most one of the wisest persons I've come across on, on the internet. And he mentioned a, a reductionist formula that does away with context in thinking about identity, situations, circumstances, relationships, and so on. So a reductionist formula that does away with context. And uh, I think that maybe this ties in with this, you know, crazy language monkeys that we, our brains can get hijacked by by words often, or by some concepts. And uh, somehow that seems to prevent an ability to think rationally, because it leads to a decontextualized thinking, which isn't, it's, it's not actually tied to the situation you're in. And therefore it, it becomes, um, it becomes an obstacle towards what we could call intelligent action and uh, a tendency to, to go into some wild uh, intellectual sort of fantasy process. And I, I've seen even, you know, typical very intellectual people, sometimes it seems maybe especially vulnerable to this maybe men are more vulnerable to it in general than women for example uh, I, I i don't know but but it seems to be a very very major phenomenon for humans and um, this is one of those things that has been pointed out to me about 10 years ago and it's just it's just grown and grown and grown in my mind that's just how massively pervasive this is in humanity. It's like just massively pervasive, like almost like a pandemic of the mind, this tendency to reduce something to some kind of an abstraction which removes context. So I wanted to put that in. Because if we could do something about that, I would suppose this could really open the path towards more intelligent thinking. <laughs> One of the things that I really appreciate about science is that a belief in science, a theory, takes the form of a model. And they keep reminding us, the model is not the system. The map is not the territory. The model is, a, is your best current approximation to what's observable reality. And you should expect it to be overthrown eventually. And so you are not wedded to the model. The belief is simply the current best understanding. So when somebody attacks the model, they're not attacking me. They're saying your model doesn't tell the whole story, which I, of course it doesn't. No model does. It's the best thinking I have now. And if somebody says, oh, your model's wrong, I'll say it, it could very well be. Can you propose a better one? Because if the model is wrong, then there has to be an improved model. And I pass it back to the other person find a better model because this is the best one I have so far. 
sale. I love that way of looking at science because so often I hear people decry science as a series of failures and that it's always wrong. In fact, that's one of the best things about science. Right. And people don't understand that. They say science is always wrong. It's led us to all these mistakes. You know, and it just shows a lack of understanding of science. I wanted to make one follow-up comment to my earlier notion about good and bad, okay? In that I don't, by the way, just stop there. I have found that rather than saying good and bad are the way that I would characterize my days or moments, I've actually tried applying a different notion, which is this one of being in as constant as possible in a state of appreciation. That to me is a good way to live life, but not labeling it bad, good, otherwise, you know, it's just to appreciate what's going on. And I wanted to say that that was my follow-up comment to this, you know, horse that ran away story. Over for now. Yeah, I just want to go back to the model being wrong comment because I think that isn't it possible that sometimes it's not the model that's wrong, but the data that's put in that didn't belong, like was put in inaccurately. Yep, that's that's one of the reasons models have flaws in them that can easily be corrected. That's like these these experiments, like we're talking about with these MRI imaging. You've only got a few measurements, a few experiments, and very often when you get more and more experiments, and in science, you have to replicate experiments to make sure that there wasn't a flaw in the experiment. And eventually you do find, yeah, that it was a small data set, it was a small demographic, there was a flaw in the procedure. This turns up all the time. My part of the scientific protocol is to replicate experiments. That's why scientists ask each other for their data. Exactly. Well, and that this is a problem that I've had because like Sam, you mentioned before that you want, you would like to go further into that article and see, you know, what was actually, you know, being measured. And as a lay person, I've tried to do that at times and I couldn't get that information. Yeah. In politics, it's near impossible to get the data that somebody is forming a political opinion on. Yeah. By the way, I find that the, uh with more appreciation for data and especially big data and learning methods and statistical methods. There's a site, uh, it doesn't have everything, but it's a, a collecting place for a lot of interesting data sets. It's called Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E.com. So if you guys go there, you don't just find data, but you also find the analysis that people have applied to that data. And when the COVID hit, this is one of the best places to go to really understand what was going on. In fact, Johns Hopkins University would publish their results there. They would use other data sets there. Everybody could take that data and make their own set of analysis and put it out there. And in fact, a lot of people did. This, I think, is a indicator of the kind of collective thinking that's possible if we actually make these tools and resources available over. You have your hand up, Josh. Yeah, I was just enjoying this conversation so much, especially our talk before about autism and on the spectrum and defining things and being perplexed. But what, what Sam just said, uh, when I first got on the internet, I found a website, I think it was in 93, one of the, my early internet experiences called Nerd World. And it was sort of an aggregation right when HTML started taking things out of alt groups. And it was a big directory of all the data sets of all the different parts of the government and it was mostly just an html version of all these data sets at that time and i, I do remember kaggle if i'm not mistaken being a software company back in the early 90s i think at one point because I, I remember it, still is. I think it's still it is. is yeah okay because i'm so happy to hear that it's evolved i haven't thought about them for about 15 years so I used to buy software from Kaggle. I remember having an account at their website, but um, I guess what I'm trying to say is defining things to the point where they collapse upon themselves and are no longer relevant is what I heard Stacy saying earlier in the conversation. Whereas if, I, I don't know how to 
um, put it into succinct words, but if we're constantly curious about something, but we want to define it to a point to make it so it's not perplexed or vexing for us, then once we've done that, we've taken out the ability to let it be fun and to define it. Yeah, <laughs> or Toberlo. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is we're caught in a system feedback loop. And I think we've all gathered because we're all somewhat on a spectrum of something. I wanted to say, and it's nice to be with people that like to meet on a Sunday and talk about these things. So this is awesome. Thank you. What was the Toblerone comment about? <laughs> that went over my head. I see you're eating it, but what does that have to do with the conversation? Anything? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, just, just checking. <laughs> the snack is not the territory. <laughs> the snack is not the territory. <laughs> but speaking to what Josh just said, to me, that's the biggest indicator. If you can stay in that confusion, and hold it loosely enough to continue on as you continually evaluate it. That's the kind of thinkers that, at least the ones that I want to hear and engage with. Maria Popova, who writes the, um, used to be called Brain Pickings, I think she changed the name of it. She, ha she had a, a couple of interesting uh, pieces on this point of being able to hold two competing perspectives in mind without resolving them. And there's a poet, and I forget which poet it is, gave it a name, a curious name, negative capability. Negative capability is the ability to not have to choose one of two competing perspectives, but to hold both of them as possibilities unresolved, and then do the research to figure out which one can be ruled out if, if either, or maybe, you know, or maybe. So that, that notion of being able to hold two perspectives in mind without resolving them while you do the research. That's a powerful tool for thought or capability. And it's it's not a new idea in science because it goes back to this particular poet whose name I don't remember that called it by this curious name, negative capability. <clears throat> I wonder, could, could even science in the real sense be practiced at all without that capability? I don't think it so. It seems almost Bingo. like it's it's yeah. fundamental. It's fundamental to hold not just two but multiple. Right. Yeah. Very. By the way, thing. that's that's the way yeah. a lot of AI systems were built until recently. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I say until recently only because there's been this you know massive uh, shiny object called uh, machine learning now that everybody seems to be putting their time and energy into. By Which the is way, fine, but it ignores other approaches. Is what is my point. By the way, I can throw in one little thing there. I, yeah, I think this is actually like at the core of all rational thinking: this ability to hold an idea somewhat loosely and not be married to it and be open for <clears throat> revision right. and so on. And that there is a very uh, clear. Uh, emotional component here. I mentioned it earlier. I think this is right up Doug's alley, actually, that fear, the emotion of fear seems to be something that directly prevents this ability. Uh, fear of the unknown or fear of uncertainty, while this <clears throat> alternative emotional state of wonder and possibly also this sort of appreciation for whatever is here seems to be a, an emotional state which is conducive to the ability to think rationally. Yeah. Stacey? Yeah, I just want to add, I, I agree, Glenn. And I also just want to point out that while probably most of us on this call would have the frustration kind of reaction to the not knowing, if any reaction at all, there's a whole nother group of people that will just shut down to avoid that. And I think that's, yeah, <laughs> I'll just leave it there. <laughs> My riff on what Glenn was just saying was, this is also the key meme behind this other statement, strong ideas loosely held. Yeah. And I'll add, this also, I think, exemplifies the importance 
of establishing a communication context. Because if you have a, a good communication context, it will be a context where the participant's primary purpose for being there is to learn. And the, there may be a necessity for a certain sort of atmosphere of friendliness or people feeling a certain safety, so to say, to, to be able to access this mind, which is capable of holding ideas lightly and is capable of listening to others' views and is capable of both asking and receiving questions in a way that uh, builds understanding. I really wish Paul, go ahead, Sam. Well, I want to follow up then on Glenn's fear idea. I think what I've not heard much uh, discussed or expressed, but to me, I think it's a real phenomenon, is this notion of intellectual fear. That some of us feel like we're not smart enough to participate, that I'm not authoritative enough, that I'm not informed enough. And <laughs> not I, in these circles. <laughs> that's an interesting response, actually. <laughs> That's an interesting response because I do feel that that can hold each of us back. And I think if we recognize that, hey, there's a big bell curve, just like with every other phenomenon, there's a big bell curve of people who do this, then I'm comfortable where I am on the bell curve. There's always people who are going to be smarter than me. There's always people I can help out. I should be comfortable where I am. And it's an honesty to be able to say that to say, yeah, there's going to be smarter than people. And hopefully they'll be able to help me out and uh, help me learn things. So I think that intellectual fear, or you call it whatever you want, is a thing that could hold us back. And naming it, I think, is an interesting that I haven't seen done too much before. I mean, yes, there is shame. You know, it's talked about that way, but not in the terms of, it being a form of fear specifically over. What about the word ego? Does that relate to this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it, uh, I've observed sometimes when, I, how do I put it? When I'm a little bit more, let's say, speaking from the ego, whatever you want to call it, it's this weird, tendency to jump between thinking that I'm this enormous genius and suddenly thinking I don't understand anything at all. It's, it's this weird oscillation between two opposites of very delusional sort of self evaluation. <laughs> I wonder if that sort of is connected with it's called being in the ego or this intellectual fear. Josh. Josh. I just had this thing bubble up right when Glenn said ego. And I was thinking, you know, we've done all these analogies of what an ego is. But what came up for me is that ego, in my mind, are a pair of shoes. So when you come into someone's house or into a discussion, some people take their shoes off and leave them at the door. Some people have them, but you need the ego to walk around because the sensitivity of your soul to get pounded, you know, you need something between your feet and the ground if you're going on long journeys, but some people have no ego and they have no shoes and they just walk the earth with no <laughs> shoes. I've, not that that means that person has no ego, but in the metaphor of shoes, it's a necessity to have something to protect you in a group, meaning having no ego is dangerous, but if your feet are calloused enough and you have a good enough soul, you can walk around with no ego. So I just wanted to throw in that shoe analogy of an ego and some people bring their ego into a room and track in all the crap that comes with it all over the house. And some people take them off at the door. And then so, some people form calluses on their souls. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I hope that lands. Thank you, Sam, for letting me share that. And thank you, Glenn, for bringing up the ego. Because I think it is important to have one. I do think when I lose my ego, I get in a lot of problems because people are like, oh, look at you. You're so awesome. You don't even have an ego. You don't think about yourself. Oh, you're so selfless. Oh, you want to help everyone? Fuck you. You're a piece of shit. You're 
flying. You're just as, as an asshole as I am. And you only care about yourself. Just like I only care about myself. We only care about ourselves. So to pretend that we want to work as a group is bullshit. And that's never true in human society. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Isn't there a balance between the two? Can't you want to help other people and help yourself? And can't you find equilibrium? And they're like, nope. I'm like, whoa, who calloused your soul? Who hurt your ego? Anyway, win, win. <laughs> yeah, that's my rant. I'm just saying, yeah, win, win. It's like, no, mm. there's no such thing as win, win. A good compromise is when both team, both parties lose. <laughs> lose, lose is equal. Win, win is a Vietnamese wedding. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not touching that one. Uh, let's see. Hey, we got about 10 uh, minutes. Uh, actually, Stacy, why don't you say something and I'm going to say a couple of yeah. comments. Look, I just want to say, and I've heard this expressed somewhere before, and for me, the ego is like just just a boundary of who you are. I mean, it's important because it's the outline of who you are. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there because it's, it's not a bad thing. <clears throat> it is, hopefully you will embody that in the best way possible, but it is an outline. This as well as the we are all one notion, I think it'll be great fodder for a future session. Okay. But I wanted to make the following two comments. Um, it is not a, uh, let, me, let me just make the following observation. Uh, the Saturday conversations, to the extent that they are mostly Barry, Stacy, and me and a few others, occasionally Josh shows up and a few other people, uh, to the extent that they overlap a lot with whoever ends up coming on Sundays, we could try and do the kind of thing we do here today on Saturdays. Uh, that's just a, a possible idea, okay? Because the reason this exists is because it didn't seem possible on Saturdays. That's why I had to just say, hey, this is a different thing. See if it's interested for you, interesting for you. If not, don't come on Sundays, but Saturdays are still available for the existing format. That was one idea. And that's not a uh, demand. That's just a possible observation that we could use it that way. The next is an observation on the way Saturdays have gone for the last four or five years. Okay. Now, some of you recognize F SFNP, the storming, forming, norming, performing model of organizations. Okay. I actually, uh, you don't, Stacey? Okay, so there's an organizational model that says when people get together and they're trying to form teams or trying to figure out how to work together, there's a storming period where there's a lot of arguing and people are sort of stepping all over each other and saying, you don't understand me. That's the storming notion. Then as they get to familiarize themselves more, there's what's called this forming notion. They actually say, okay, I'm in, or I'm out, or you know, I agree with you, or these are the things we want to do. That's the forming notion. Then there's a norming uh, phase where, okay, now we're just trying to you know, settle our agreements or settle our norms, et cetera. And then there's the performing phase where you're now, you got rid of all that chaos, and now you're really highly efficient, really doing things, really you know, knocking off projects. That's the storming, forming, norming, performing model of organizations. Thank you. If you choose to look at it this way, I find it possible to map the last five years of our GCC Saturday and possibly even Sunday conversations as the first two, the storming and forming phases. I think this Sunday thing that I'm proposing right now is a possible mix of forming, but mostly norming. We haven't yet performed yet. I think that's still to be shown, but I'm just throwing that out there as a possible way to look at GCC. And the reason I look at it that way is, it's interesting to note how long these phases take when there is almost zero structure to begin with. Then nobody tries, I, I tried hard not to be the, focus. I know that some people consider myself to be, but, you know, I try hard not to be on Saturdays or for GCC at all, okay, and try to let things emerge. But in light of that, it's just taken about five years, it looks like, for that to take place, for, if, for even some S and F to happen, 
and for us to even think about moving into an end. Now, other people could have been there way sooner than me. I'm just slower than others. Okay, so that's just an observation. Over. Yeah, Josh. Mind if I add to that just for real quick? Sure. Uh, I just looked up that model. I think it says Bruce Tuckerman. But anyway, there's a thing at the end called the adjourning. So forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning, which is the letting go of all the stuff that you've done in those four processes, meaning uh, referred to as the transition of mourning phase, shift to process orientation, sadness, recognition of team and individual efforts, disabandoning. So... I love this because I think we've gone through all five of these many, many times in GCC. Even the letting go of Tammy saying, I'm going to be here forever. And then, oh, wait, I'm in love with Harry and I'm moving to <laughs> over there. And, you know, just, all right, letting go of Tammy. And, hey, wait, she's back. She's saying hi. And, you know what I mean? We've, I think we've mourned a lot of people in our GCC conversations that have came. And Neil Davidson used to be here a lot. I, I miss his voice. And um, who's the gentleman from New Zealand that was always here talking and wonderful stories? Tex, Dave Tech Smith. Uh, he, he brought a lot to our conversations with his wonderful storytelling. And, and I, I miss it. I mean, I try to keep in touch with him on Facebook as much as I can. But uh, I'm just saying we've, we've mourned a lot of people here at GCC. And I think that's an important part of the process to I, I wouldn't call it a journey, but mourning. The the death of conversations, the death of uh, the the times when you had Sam two hours of everyone being able to speak and share. I, I never got to do my two hours, but um, I never I could have. You let me anytime I wanted to, but I just never felt like I was in the space to do it at the time when we were doing that, and then it went away. And I don't know if uh, Colin really got to do his two hours or did you get to do yours, Stacy or Barry? Did I know I did, a, I did a session or two, I think, Sam, didn't I? The deep dive? Yeah, some focus ones. I think you came after most of those deep dives, I believe. But my yes, memory, Sam. this is this is years ago, right? This is Sam yeah. had several sessions. Yes. And I, had, I really I had counted the heck out of that two hours. Yeah, you, you had like six or seven or eight sessions, but it was great. I mean, uh, I had the two, I think. The, the only other thing I wanted to bring up is just having, even if it's a six month or an annual review, just to sort of cap it off and just say, okay, this year we did great in these things and we did horrible, and just some sort of, we know annually. So it doesn't, bleed, years don't bleed into each other. That would be great. Yeah, I, I think we have held some of these annual discussions at least two or three times. I think we did it on either September 30th or whatever date was closest to September 30th, which was the submission date for the original proposal. I don't think we did it last year. I think I probably forgot. But uh, in, in addition to that, we've also had uh, at times uh, surveys on what was important to people. And then I tried to do the recap on the results. So that's still out there. So retrospective, yes, I think is a good idea. Um, we don't hold sprints in anything like a two-week form, but uh, at least occasionally, I do agree, it's good to look back and say, what worked? What should we continue doing? What didn't work? What should we stop doing? What should we start doing that's different than what we've been doing? And what we do we not yet understand that we just need to park for later conversation? Those are the uh, typical questions that drive, in my mind, a retrospective. Uh, that can drill through to other questions. I have a little story about that. Um, I, it's one example I remember vividly. Uh, I remember it was a Sunday session many years ago. And um, I think that was a good example, I think, of something we did which worked, but it was also sort of a pointer towards more possibilities that maybe we haven't gone into, but it was ignited by me sharing a, a meme with a picture of Hillary Clinton as a as a vampire, and it was very. You know, I remember silly. that vividly, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, it was very silly, uh, but I just thought it was really funny <laughs> and in a sort of childish way, and and then that led to uh, uh, some reactions in that thread, and then. Um, I think it was Anna who invited me to, to join the, the, the unblocking session. 
and, and we sort of that became the, the theme and several people there, I think Colin was definitely there, Gog was there, I think maybe Tammy was there, this from uh, woman from Germany was there, uh, and um, I think Lucy was there. Yeah, there so were several people, and, and, and we really went into many of these incredibly hard topics that, that sort of are related to cancel culture or sort of the question of censorship and, and what are unacceptable statements and how one should respond to just these really complicated, difficult uh, questions. And I remember right before the end, I had this strong sense that we had arrived right before a completely new understanding of the importance of personal responsibility. And that somehow a kind of radical personal responsibility for my behavior without judging the actions of others seemed to be the only real resolution to this dilemma because we really went into this dilemma but then two hours had gone and you know we didn't have time to go into it uh and uh but 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 i remember vividly that we it was like we came right up to the point where at least i felt that there was a real solution to, to the really complicated thing that we discussed, but, but we didn't have time to go into it. And I don't think that that thread was, was continued. So, so that was a great example of really coming very far in two hours into an incredibly tough topic. It was also an example of an opportunity that could have been continued, but which wasn't so really. It's fascinating that you recap that. Uh, number one, Colin, if you have that in your search uh, utility, it'd be interesting to uh, link us to that particular session. But really, Glenn, I was wondering, since you felt that after two hours, we really reached something, um, do you think that held? Or has that kind of diminished over time? What do you mean held? This notion of personal responsibility and the role it has and how we engage and uh, how we're triggered. Do you think that that notion has really been embraced and has been held in practice? Because I see that that theme has continually reappeared. Yeah, 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 I, I know what you mean. It, it definitely has reappeared. And uh, I think that is one of the reasons why it's, it's actually a very essential thing because if, if you if you have a really essential insight then maybe one of the characteristics of it is that it keeps just returning again and again in different yeah. occasions and i think that's one of those and so I, I mean we've definitely touched on it a lot in the in the bond racing sessions and so on from different angles we've, we've sort of come to it but but the specific way we arrived at it in that conversation i think was very unique because it was a real so there was a real listening and really sort of an honest sharing there that was happening and without too much intellectualizing maybe. Uh, I mean, I, I just remember it was, it was quite a unique way we arrived there <laughs> and I didn't feel that we really carried on that the momentum that we could have, let's put it that way. Uh, so there was definitely, you know, something that could have been continued there but in a similar fashion so i felt like it, we did it a little bit differently from how we've often done it on saturdays let's put it that way yeah so i was just responding to uh stacy's estimate of the date these gcc conversations didn't happen till june or sorry uh september or october 2017 so it couldn't have been early 2017 or late 2016. No. Start, what do you mean it didn't happen? Sunday's unblocking was going on in early 2017. I, I uh, started. No. That's not true. Because these calls with Doug and Tammy and others, 
didn't even start until GCC was submitted on September 30th of 2017. So it was sometime after that, possibly the following yeah. year. Yeah, we started the in 17, didn't we? Could have been late 2017, but uh, I don't think it was early 2017. Now it was right before the submission or was it kind of during the submission of that proposal? Because you guys had had several meetings before. Unblocking didn't exist in that form. Oh yeah, sorry, so, unblocking. Yeah, that came later. That's right. Yeah, unblocking came later. Yeah. Yeah, so that's right. This is why these wet uh, cranial uh, memories are not infallible. Anyway, look, yeah. we've got we've gone two hours. I really appreciate the people that have listened to the proposed guidelines for this particular Sunday session and the engagement with it, the feedback with it, as well as the uh, deep dive into at least the conversation started by this article. So I enjoyed this conversation. I look forward to more. Wait a minute before you go, because I'm just looking at the spreadsheet that Colin put in. Yep. So I'm looking at calls from, I guess, July 17 is when they started. Uh, that's when there were very, very few. It was like just Tammy and me, maybe Will and Charlton, maybe uh, Aaron. There's very, very few okay. of us back then. See, this is actually very helpful group shared memory, this spreadsheet right here. I'll put a little bit yeah. of time into this. <laughs> There's quite a few videos that are missing there, I believe, but so many videos there, nevertheless. You notice there's 900 plus lines in the spreadsheet right now? Does that mean 900 videos? No, or it could, have been, could have been videos. There's probably a couple dozen difference between the actual numbers of videos and the numbers of lines in that spreadsheet, but not many. You know, some title lines, blank lines, that sort of thing. So I appreciate it. There's actually a house guest I have to get back to, but I wanted to focus on this particular Sunday session, which uh, I really am very optimistic about. I like the kind of interactions that are happening here. Thank you, Barry, you're a huge part of that. Thank you, Glenn and Stacy and Colin and Josh and Kayla for participating in this. I I appreciate the interest and I'm looking forward to more. Thanks, Thanks Dolph. I think I'll, I'll be logging off soon as well. Yeah, but yeah, I hope to, to be able to join more of these on Sundays because I'm more interested in this 